Hello everyone, my name is Pixelrifts and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. I'm back, my internet connection got fixed, so everything is all good now. And in today's episode, we're going to focus on netherite, since we acquired some in the previous episode, but we haven't gotten a chance to use it yet. Here in one of my precious materials chests, there it is, we have left the netherite upgrade smithing templates that we got from the piglin bastion in the previous episode. We also, while we were there, acquired a netherite ingot and some ancient debris. Now ancient debris might not seem immediately related to the netherite ingot, but the two are connected. You use some of this smelted down in a furnace plus a couple of gold ingots to make a netherite ingot, and that is a crucial material for upgrading our tools to what is currently the final stage of the tech tree. Basically, we end up with slightly more powerful pickaxes and armor and other tools than we do with just diamond. The trick to these though is of course that they function like other smithing templates, the ones that we use to trim our armor, and they are consumed once you use them. So once you've acquired a netherite upgrade smithing template, it is probably more important than any other smithing template, I would argue, that you reproduce them. As with the other smithing templates, you will need seven diamonds to do this, along with a single block of related material. And as you can tell from the red color of this smithing template, netherrack is the block you need. Simply putting all of these in a crafting table with the upgrade template like that, we'll duplicate it just like the other smithing templates, and now we have three of them. I'm going to store a spare copy in here so that we can duplicate them and make sure we always have one left over just in case of other incidents, but it is now time to upgrade our first item to netherite. And I will make the argument that it's probably a pickaxe you want to upgrade first, because pickaxes are probably the most useful tool in the game when it comes to breaking blocks. Both tools and armor will receive an additional boost in durability for upgrading to netherite, and tools like diamond pickaxes, swords, axes, and shovels will all receive an additional 500 or so durability. I think it's like 480, it's something like that. But especially since we have unbreaking three on each of these, which means that they last four times as long, it means our pickaxe will last even longer. We could break 8,000 blocks, theoretically speaking, before it has the chance to wear down completely completely, and then of course we have mending to fix those back up. We also, for the moment, forestall the problem that I've already decorated some of my diamond armor with armor trims, and those trims might not look as good if we completely change the material that our armor is made of. So I'll give you a quick example here. We end up putting the upgrade template in the first slot, the piece of equipment we want to upgrade in the second slot, and finally, a netherite ingot here. And as you can see, the blue around the outside, the lapis blue that I have trimmed my helmet with, remains there along with the enchantments on this equipment, even if we upgrade it to netherite. And the shape of the helmet itself changes to have these longer, I guess, lobes on either side. That's not what we're going to do today, though. We're going to upgrade I will probably say my fortune pickaxe. After all, we're going to need a lot of diamonds to make sure we can reproduce this netherite upgrade template a few times, and we're going to be using this pickaxe a lot today in order to mine through the terrain of the nether in search of more ancient debris. There are no level requirements for upgrading your gear like this, it's not like combining stuff in an anvil, all the enchantments will be kept and we can simply lift our netherite pickaxe out of the smithing table, and that is a very exciting thing to have. Netherite upgrades can only be applied to diamond equipment though, so there's no getting a netherite bow, you can't upgrade iron directly to netherite, it's effectively an additional layer on top of the diamond that reinforces it, gives it more durability, and even, you may notice, gives it slightly more attack damage in the case of tools. If you take a look at this, 6 attack damage on this pickaxe, as opposed to 5 attack damage on my diamond pickaxe. For most of the regular tools that won't come in that useful, but then the diamond sword will gain an additional point of attack damage, diamond axes will also gain an additional point of attack damage when they are upgraded to netherite, making it slightly more effective to use netherite tools over any other type of tools. We'll take a closer look at the effects on armor in a second, but right now you're probably wondering how to get hold of a little bit more ancient debris, because if I take a bunch of this stuff and smelt it down now, the blast furnace is probably the most effective place to do this, since it will smelt things twice as fast. We end up with some netherite scrap, and we'll end up with two pieces of it from smelting down these two blocks of ancient debris. But you'll quickly find that two is not enough, because as we can see from the netherite ingot crafting recipe, it needs four netherite scrap and four gold ingots to make one ingot 
of netherite. So in today's episode, we are going to go looking for more ancient debris that we can convert into netherite scrap. You may occasionally find those in piglin bastions, so if you want to go and raid more structures in the nether, you can go looking for bastions where pre-made netherite ingots might appear alongside some more ancient debris. But the fact is, ancient debris can be found surprisingly reliably in the nether if you know where to look. The first problem with finding ancient debris though is that we need to find some solid terrain in order to go mining for it. And the terrain we have spawned in here in the Basalt Delta is kind of piecemeal. I might be able to dig down through here to get to a slightly lower coordinate of the world, but chances are sooner or later, I'm going to encounter some lava. In this case, I'm actually gonna try my best to block off the lava where I find it and dig down so that we are underneath any lava that we find, but I'm gonna need to bring some blocks with me. I'll also bring some fire resistance potions just as a precaution because you never know when that lava is gonna catch me out. And obviously there being a column of gravel here means that there is almost certainly some lava behind that, there we go. One really helpful trick to know though is to make sure that you have a divot in front of you. As long as a block is mined out in front of you and lava ends up falling in, you can be sure that the lava is going to flow down into that hole. It'll destroy any items that were in there as you just heard, but it should prevent the lava from flowing outwards towards you. As long as you're not standing too close, you're not going to be affected by it. And this has actually got us down pretty low into the world now. We are at a coordinate of 24 on the Y axis. We are aiming for Y15. That's kind of our goal coordinate here. Once we reach a Y coordinate of 15, I'm gonna place a torch here so we can see a little better. And fortunately for me, a lot of the terrain around here is starting to blend out into netherrack, which is a hopeful sign that we won't have to dig through some of these tougher materials for too long. Once again, a great way to avoid any lava that you find creeping towards you is to leave an empty air block, place a block there, and we can open out the area in front of us so that the lava can simply flow towards us. Then we can reach back, place a block a little further away, and creep slowly forward using this method. And it looks like this little lava pocket is relatively small, so we should be able to just block that in with some regular blocks. Oh, there's a little bit more lava in the walls. We can back off quickly and block that, and it looks like we should be able to proceed here. Yep, there we go. We can continue digging in a straight line. And one other thing we might want to do is hit the F3 and G keyboard shortcuts to display chunk borders. And fortunately, we're actually digging along a chunk border. So at this point, we should probably explain a little bit about how the game generates ancient data. Debris. It sort of generates them in the same way that it generates veins of ore in the overworld. But ancient debris can only be found in very small veins of material. You are only ever likely to find three of them in a single vein. And if you find more than that in one place, you've found two veins of ancient debris that generate next to each other. Potentially even as many as three or four, depending on your luck. The game generates up to three veins of ancient debris per chunk. One of those veins can be anywhere between the floor of the nether and the roof of the nether, the ceiling of the nether, which if you dig up high enough, you'll encounter a bedrock ceiling that's gonna block you from going any further. So one vein of ancient debris can be basically anywhere inside a chunk. A chunk, remember, is a 16 by 16 area. Anywhere that we're walking through here and you see one of these blue borders to either side of us, that marks off the edges of this 16 by 16 area we're currently standing in. That is the edge of this chunk. But the game will attempt to generate two more veins of ancient debris below a coordinate of Y32, below the level of the lava lakes in the nether. And that affords us the opportunity to go mining down here and reliably find ancient debris. Although some players might laugh at me for calling this reliable because it is a bit of a luck-based thing. It really just depends whether or not you dig into ancient debris or not. There are some ways that we can use to uncover it a little bit later. But in the meantime, conventional wisdom dictates that if we dig along a chunk border, like the one that I was showing you a second ago, we might end up finding some ancient debris that has generated on either side of these chunk borders. We're effectively looking at two different chunks every time we dig along a border like this. So it makes sense that we might find more ancient debris because we are looking at two separate areas in which it can spawn. Since we've run into a lava pocket here, we have a couple of different options. I've tried my best to spam a few blocks around here and see if I can block any of it off, but the lava pocket seems quite large. So we can either go around it or go through it by drinking a potion of fire resistance, dipping into the lava, blocking off any lava that we come across, or at least blocking off enough lava that we can have a safe tunnel through here 
here and continuing the tunnel we've already started digging. For now though, I'm going to try to go around it. So we're going to dig a little bit to the left here and it looks like that was the edge of this lava pocket. So we can probably just block off a couple more blocks in here and sooner or later we can find ourselves back on that chunk border having navigated around that lava pocket. Once we leave the basalt delta though and end up in a different biome, we'll hit a lot of netherrack and we'll have absolutely no problem tearing through it, which is something I recommend doing with caution of course because we're still going to run into pockets of lava as we go. And sooner or later we're going to strike lucky. Above us in the ceiling here is our first naturally discovered piece of ancient debris. And as you can see I've now dug 440 blocks away from 00, zero which is relatively close to my spawn point and this tunnel has become incredibly long. So this is why I was saying people would laugh at me when I said this was a reliable process because using this basic 1x2 tunnel method you are basically just holding out hope that a vein of ancient debris happens to have generated in the area that you are digging and it looks like it might just be one although it's always worth looking around in the walls to either side just in case a block of ancient debris has spawned on a diagonal. Nope, looks like we just got the one block out of that, which is really unfortunate actually. It can occur in veins of up to three, which means a vein of two is possible, and a vein of two would at least allow us to complete another netherite ingot. But it's worth remembering that every time we cross one of these blue borders, we are entering another chunk, and that chunk has two chances for a vein of ancient debris to spawn, so chances are we are going to run into another vein relatively soon. Of course the other problem is going to be running into lava pockets that we can't block off, so I'm going to drink a bottle of fire resistance, I'm going to slowly wade in to this lava pocket, and we're going to use the opportunity to place blocks where we can, making sure that we have a completely blocked off tunnel through this pocket of lava. It can be a little bit scary wading into a pocket of lava for the first time, especially since the visibility is very decreased, and it will leave you with this burning aura of fire, which can last for a couple of minutes after you've stood in lava. But if you plan on keeping a straight line, the fire resistance effect can be incredibly useful to you, especially when we encounter lava pockets this frequently. This lava pocket is so large, I can't even see the walls that I'm bridging towards, so it really does end up feeling like a leap of faith after a while and it can be very easy to get lost inside of here. Once we've reached the opposite wall we can basically build a 1x2 tunnel for us to travel through and then it's just a matter of filling in all of the blocks inside that tunnel and removing them again as we mine on through. We're now over 650 blocks away from that 0, zero coordinate so I think I'm probably going to turn around and head back for the moment. My fire resistance has maybe a couple of minutes left on it and I want to make sure I can get back without having to use another potion in case there are any mishaps. We've also acquired a lot of material here and only one piece of ancient debris has shown itself in the tunnel so far. So another option that we have if we take a look at these chunk borders is simply to dig a tunnel along a different axis. We can go left to right here instead of forwards and backwards and we can dig along this chunk border here. Then once we hit the border of that chunk we can turn a corner and start digging an identical tunnel in the same direction we dug our first one. And the purpose of digging these tunnels along the same direction is really just to make sure this area doesn't become a maze of tunnels. Ideally I want to make sure that all of my tunnels start at the same place that way it's easy for me to find my way back and we can mark that with a few torches just indicating that this is the way out because we might also want to start a tunnel off in this direction so that we can mine along a chunk border over this way. And here at last we have found our second piece of ancient debris along with solid evidence that ancient debris does does generate in basalt deltas. So it's not like the block is impossible to find within this biome, it's simply going to be more time consuming as a process because we have to dig through all of this tougher material. Once again I'm going to dig out a 3x3 area here just to make sure that we don't have any more blocks of ancient debris hiding on the diagonals, but no, unfortunately it looks like we only have two ancient debris so far. Either way though, that is enough for us to return to our base and create a second netherite ingot. We could use that to upgrade our second pickaxe if we want to. And I'm going to leave that to smelt in here whilst I drop off the rest of these blocks over in my storage system. Which isn't quite ready for me to dump everything in the input chest and have it automatically sorted yet, but I'm working on it. But now with our netherite scrap collected from the blast furnace, we can finally craft our first netherite ingot. Which once again we can use with the smithing table and an upgrade template to upgrade a 
piece of my equipment. Duplicating these smithing templates is pretty expensive diamond wise, though I've used 14 diamonds in this episode alone. So let's make this count. We're going to use our second netherite ingot to upgrade my diamond hoe, <laughs> which has seen better days. But in this case, I'm doing this because not only does it get us additional durability increase, it gets us the advancement. <laughs> yes, there is an advancement for crafting a netherite hoe. This is kind of a legacy thing. It's based on having used up a diamond hoe previously would get you the serious dedication advancement because hoes were only ever really used for creating farmland. And so if you had done that much farming, the game assumed you were pretty dedicated to farming. Of course, in updates since Minecraft 1.16, hoes have become useful for a variety of other things, not least a silk touch hoe being able to gather leaves from trees with a lot larger durability than shears, even more so now that we have a netherite hoe with 2000 durability. And if that seemed like an absurd thing to do when we could upgrade any more of our more important tools and not just this one I'm keeping in the ender chest for now, you're probably right about that, but it's fun. <laughs> anyway, back here in the overworld, we can collect a couple of things that will help us search for ancient debris. Because the problem we've encountered so far is that we're only able to dig a one by two tunnel, and that doesn't expose a lot of the blocks within a chunk that could potentially contain ancient debris. It is, of course, perfectly possible for us to mine out the entire contents of a chunk below lava lake level. Obviously, we'll need some fire resistance potions if the lava creeps in on us, but we are guaranteed to find some ancient debris if we do that. But up here we do have some things that can make it faster, like TNT for example. As long as I bring a flint and steel with me, or a flame bow, or something that we can use to light the TNT, we can set off a chain reaction of TNT which will open out a wide area of the nether, allowing us to see where ancient debris has generated. But if we want to, we can also take advantage of one of Minecraft's quirkier behaviors. So I'm gonna grab a crafting table and bring some wood and wool with me, and we can talk about one of Minecraft's less conventional explosives. For this demonstration, we are gonna return to the long tunnel of Netherrack as we left the Basalt Delta, because Netherrack is obviously a fairly easy block to mine and a fairly easy block to break by other methods as well. So explosions are going to deal a lot more damage to netherrack than they are to the surrounding terrain of blackstone and basalt in a basalt delta. One of the first things we can do is place some TNT down here. And we're gonna put this maybe four blocks apart or so. I don't have a great deal of TNT right now, so we are probably going to go through lighting this manually if it doesn't create a chain reaction. We placed about half of it for now. I'm going to light this first TNT and I'm going to back away once I have lit it. It should give you about four seconds to get away. And as you can see, the TNT has been able to set off a bit of a chain reaction. So what's happened there is that the explosive radius of the TNT has lit the next TNT block over, but it's exploded a great deal of the terrain around it, which should get us a look at whether or not there is any ancient debris hidden in the walls here. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like there is any here. And you might be wondering, what if the TNT blew the ancient debris up? Well, ancient debris as a block is blast proof, so you shouldn't have any concerns about the TNT blowing it up. That's why we can use TNT in the first place. Oh, and it looks like one of the TNT blocks may have been lit on fire by the nearby lava. <laughs> Even if the lava isn't directly adjacent to the TNT, yep, <laughs> it can cause some explosions. Anyway, obviously that exposed a pretty large lava pocket here. There's lava pouring down from the ceiling, so we need to tread carefully. But as you can see on the other side, we have exposed a vein of two ancient debris that we simply didn't find by cutting into our tunnel, even though it was only diagonally a couple of blocks off to the left. Naturally, at this point, our main challenge is getting to that ancient debris, but we can block off the sources of lava when it's flowing down from the ceiling like that, and hopefully we should be able to bridge over safely once that is taken care of. Another thing it's worth knowing, just in case you're concerned about this, is that along with being blast proof, ancient debris is also fireproof. In fact, one of the advantages of netherite as an upgrade is that it makes any of your netherite equipment fireproof. If I throw my netherite pickaxe into lava here, you will see that it simply floats up to the surface. It doesn't get destroyed like some other blocks that we could throw into lava. And the same is true of 
ancient debris, or in fact anything netherite related. The ancient debris, netherite scrap and netherite ingots will all survive being thrown into lava or set on fire. That doesn't mean the items themselves are invulnerable though, they can still be destroyed by other means. If I were to throw them on the ground so that they hovered here as item entities and then blow them up with TNT, those item entities would be gone for good since they don't have the blast resistance that a block placed in the world does. So even though blocks of ancient debris will not be broken by TNT explosions, it is very much worth noting that the ancient debris and your netherite gear is not going to be blast proof. Let's light this TNT and quickly run back across the bridge here and hopefully we should uncover, there we go, a little bit more ancient debris immediately. So as you can see, uncovering ancient debris this way has already been a lot faster. We've already gathered four and I've only been here for about five minutes compared to the half hour I was mining in a straight line. If you're on a multiplayer server though, destruction on this scale is always a bit of a dicey subject, so it's probably worth making sure you've checked with your server mates just in case they have any rules about where you can mine for netherite. Unfortunately for me though, I have now run out of TNT. That's all the TNT I owned. We could craft more using gunpowder and sand, but I don't have a reliable source of gunpowder yet, and mining all of that sand is a very time-consuming process. So instead, I'm going to chuck a few stacks of this netherrack onto the floor. We're going to pop down a crafting table, and we are going to craft some beds. And judging by the area that's dug out here, this might have been where we encountered one of our first pieces of ancient debris. So I'm actually going to move to the next chunk over in order to do this to maximize our chances of finding some debris this way. We're going to poke a hole in the wall like so. We're going to place a bed at the end of this and we're going to only click once. Make sure not to right click it immediately straight away because beds if right clicked in the nether are explosive. In fact we're probably going to set this bed a couple of blocks further into the wall so that we can try not to damage our path here. I'm going to put the bed over here, we're going to make sure there's a couple of blocks in front of it and we're going to step down a block here if we possibly can. Then if we right click on the bed and hold shift at the same time we should take relatively little damage while the bed does massive explosion damage to the terrain around it. Once again that's caused a bit of lava to fall in from the ceiling since it's excavated a pretty large area around the ceiling but the fires on the netherrack around us we can put out by punching them. And once again, with a large area carved out by this explosion, it should be possible to see if there is any ancient debris hiding in the walls. Once again, unfortunately, it looks like we didn't get too lucky. And you might want to take a fire resistance potion with you once again, just to make sure that you don't end up with a bunch of fire lit underneath you from the bed explosion. So why do beds explode in the nether? It really goes back to the idea of using a bed to set your spawn point in the overworld. Yep, there we go, we ended up with a bunch of fire lit under us at this time, that's why I don't like this method all that much, it can end up causing a lot of fires that you don't expect. But in the early days of Minecraft, when the nether was first introduced, the developers didn't want you setting your spawn in the nether, because it was quite a hostile environment, it was going to be kind of difficult to get back to the overworld if you were constantly respawning in the nether, and it seemed like a funny idea to make beds explode when you tried to use them to set your spawn in the nether. That behavior has remained to this day, even though there are now ways you can set your spawn in the nether, which once again, we'll talk about in future episodes. But that has led to this somewhat infamous behavior being immortalized in Minecraft permanently. And even to this day, if you are killed by the explosion from a bed, the death message will read that you were killed by intentional game design. Whoa, we found ourselves in lava that time though. That is <laughs> a little bit dicey. Okay, let's drink a potion of fire resistance. Now we are out of there. And let's eat some food to make sure that our hunger can build back up again. Our hearts can heal. And then I'm going to step in and make sure that I clear up wherever this source of lava is coming from here in the ceiling. Looks like it was coming from a single lava pocket right there. So that should be nice and easy to deal with. But as you can see, the potential for unpleasant surprises is one of the things that puts me off using this bed method. Even though the materials required to explode large areas of the nether are incredibly cheap, it is simply too destructive for my tastes. There is too much potential risk to the player. The explosion damage is actually pretty intense if you do it without digging that hole and having a couple of blocks to hide behind from the explosion. And in this case, it hasn't been especially lucrative either. It's not like we're not going to get ancient debris this way eventually. We've simply had some poor luck here, but it seems to me like the TNT method is so much more controlled 
and reliable. Plus, the TNT method is clearing out a larger tunnel for us, whereas the bed method requires you to dig out the tunnel to either side. There are different ways of applying this though, and you can basically choose whichever method you end up preferring. If you'd like to just dig a long tunnel in the hope that you'll encounter some ancient debris as you go, or if you'd like to use some explosives to do the job, sooner or later you're going to end up with a decent amount of ancient debris. One last thing to be aware of when using these explosive methods though, is that the biome you are digging under is going to make itself known down here in the lower areas of the nether. After we left the basalt delta where all of the blackstone and basalt is, we ended up underneath a warped forest, and you can tell from the fact that there are endermen down here, which obviously presents the hazard of accidentally looking at one of them and drawing its aggro. If we dig underneath a crimson forest or a nether wastes biome, you might find piglins underneath here, which would be a problem for me right now because I'm not wearing any gold armor. Hoglins can also generate if you dig underneath the crimson forest, so that would prove especially dangerous for you, but it is much less likely that you're going to encounter anything that you can't deal with if you're just digging a 1x2 tunnel. So now we're going to duplicate our smithing template a couple more times actually, considering that we might as well just do this, we're going to need it a lot in future anyway. We're going to grab four gold ingots, we're going to smell to these four ancient debris, and we're going to make an upgrade to our armor so we can see the effect that netherite has on that. We'll grab our netherite ingot out of the crafting interface here. I think I'm going to upgrade my boots first, because these are pretty valuable to me. I have a bunch of different enchantments on them. Even though they have blast protection, I still think I'm going to be going with these boots for a while. And those are going to upgrade to netherite with the armor trim intact and all of the enchantments. And you'll notice that there's a bit of a difference here between the stats. These diamond boots have plus three armor and plus two armor toughness. The netherite boots have plus three armor, plus three armor toughness, and plus one to knockback resistance. They are genuinely made of sturdier stuff, and when I equip these, now my armor is all mismatched again. But that's fine, we'll be getting some more netherite in the near future and we should be able to upgrade our full suit of armor to the highest possible tier. Armor toughness is a property unique to diamond and netherite armor, and what that does is reduce the impact of harder hitting enemies. So enemies like Enderman or Hoglins or even the Warden, if you're aware of the Warden, which we haven't covered in this series yet, but those enemies will deal more damage to you if you're wearing iron armor, let's say, not just because of the protection that that armor provides, but also because of an armor toughness rating that just gives diamond and netherite the edge over enemies that would deal more damage in a single hit. Knockback resistance also prevents you from being pushed away by enemies whose attacks have that effect. For example, a skeleton with a punch bow, or enemies like hoglins that tend to fling you into the air or push you backwards. So a full suit of netherite is going to give you four points of knockback resistance, which you can't get from any other armor. Armor. So that's another advantage of netherite alongside increased durability and its invulnerability to fire. With our first netherite upgrades done, we've got the netherite hoe, the netherite pickaxe, and some fancy looking boots. That is where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. And we're going to be revisiting ancient debris and netherite a few times across this series so that we can look at more effective ways of mining, especially once we have more access to explosives like TNT. But I think that's where we're gonna leave for this episode. Thank you so much for watching the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care, bye for now.